Welcome to the Robotics for an Infectious Diseases interview series. I'm Dr. Robin Murphy, the Raytheon Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M and a founder of the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue. We have Tamara Barbosa here to provide a boots on the ground or really a boots in the hospital perspective for roboticists to consider. Tamara has a Master's of Science in Healthcare Emergency Management from Boston University and afterwards, she worked as the safety operations coordinator for Mass, Ear, and Eye, a Boston teaching hospital where she managed and led public safety operations and environment of care, including emergency management drills and exercises. And she's now pursuing her doctorate in occupational therapy with her capstone project on disaster management. Tamara, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Dr. Jason Motes will interview Tamara. Jason's an Associate Division Director of the Emergency Services Training Institute at Texas A&M's Engineering Extension Service. And he has a joint appointment with the Bush School of Government and Public Policy, leveraging his decades of experience in all aspects of emergency management. He was also a co-host of the White House OSTP workshops on robotics for infectious diseases back in 2015 during the Ebola outbreak and it's been providing a user-centric push for robots ever since. Welcome, Jason, and please take it away. Well, thanks, Robin. Tamara, welcome. We're so glad to see you. How's, uh, glad to see that uh, the sun's shining bright out there in California. So <laughs> yeah. let's jump right into this. You know, uh, as we look at this, I'm curious to know how are regulations relaxed in a pandemic like what we're experiencing now? For example, like with the allowance of telemedicine visits. Sure. So um, although I'm in California, I am speaking in regards to Massachusetts. So um, effective March 16th, Massachusetts Department of Public Health stated that all commercial insur insurance plans, including self-insured plans and um, et cetera, are required to cover in-network medically necessary telehealth services related to COVID-19 testing and treatment. Um, but they also established their um, provided requirements for insurers to establish their own um, requirements for telehealth services, but they cannot be more restrictive than those established by Mass Health. So Mass Health permitted um, qualified providers to deliver clinically appropriate and medically necessary um, telehealth. And they did not impose any requirements for these technologies, uh, meaning that these could be delivered via telephone or a live video. Um, and that was for medically necessary and clinically appropriate. Additionally, the, the um, laws within Mass Health um, have been adjusted to accommodate to the payment. So the rate of the payment for the services delivered via telehealth uh, are the same as services delivered via traditional methods. Um, also, they've um, adjusted prescriptions. So a provider may prescribe medications via telehealth um, as long as they're following re requirements. So with that being said, um, those types of accommodations have been made in response to the COVID-19, um, and that was through the Department of Public Health that established that initial change. Um, yeah, so. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing, uh, you know, thinking about this. So, you know, the topic of the today is robots. So as we take a look at that, you know, robots are part of telehealth or certainly could be. Are you concerned that robots used for clinical or logistical support would continue to further isolate, socially isolate patients? Yeah, so I think that um, in this current climate, I think that most of my colleagues and I, and I speak to that, um, the people that are actually working on the grounds because I'm remote. So that includes my director, Ryan Jordan and Matt Catuno, who work with um, emergency management currently. Um, I think that m a lot of us are in agreement that technology supports human interaction and it's helpful and better than no interaction at all. However, um, I personally believe that it can't replace human interaction, but it can help facilitate the interaction in a safe way. And it can also, um, as a result, uh, preserve personal protective equipment. 
and lessen the risk on caregivers, patients, and healthcare professionals going to and from hospitals. Um, for instance, at uh, Mass Ioneer, they're using iPads um, to call the nurse. So instead of having the nurse go into the room, they're using the iPad to communicate in order to prevent um, the use of PPE, but also to make it more efficient and safe um, at a lower cost for everyone. Okay. So tell us, what's it like for the roboticists that are out there, tell us what it's like to be an emergency manager in a healthcare facility for something like what we're going through right now with COVID-19. Right, so as I said, I, I am remote, so I did reach out to colleagues to kind of get their input on this. Um, as much as I can support remotely, I did wanna hear their input. Um, so I think despite all of the challenges, um, some quotes that um, really uh, I held on to, they said that for the first time, I think, for a long time, every single healthcare administrator will take emergency preparedness for granted before this, right? So everyone's seeing the value of preparedness after speaking with my colleagues. They feel that this is a rewarding time to be an emergency manager. It's what we've been preparing for. Um, we're a multi-tiered emergency management system um, within a hospital, state, and federal level. So to see um, the National Incident Management System and ICS and HICS all kind of in action and working. I think that this area will never be underfunded or underappreciated, um, but it's also tested all critical areas of EOP, which is from resource management to um, even patient clinical and support activities. So never in, at least my experience, um, I've seen so many areas being on the line at once. In addition to that, there's a lot of different areas of strengths and different areas of improvement that you can always see. And those things have come to light through this. Um, so I think that a lot of my colleagues are very grateful for the relationships that they previously developed leading up until this point, but they've also been um, challenged in a way, as demanding as a pandemic can be, but it's also shown the importance of community and resilience within that. So I think that from that um, combination of those perspectives, um, although there are these mixed feelings of the day-to-day -day challenges, I think a lot of this has raised awareness um, to the importance of emergency management. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm, I wonder about is uh, you know one of the mo most important things that we have uh, as we're working in the, in the hospital is uh, the whole issue of cleaning and disinfection. You know, right. as we turn rooms over, as patients either pass or get better and get discharged, that C and D seems to be a really important uh, issue during a pandemic. And we've seen robots doing this. Or the UV germ zapping, like the Xenex robot, and and things like that. As an emergency manager, are those kinds of robots adequate? So um, previous to the pandemic, we we're actually looking at Xenex um, type of equipment to do terminal cleaning in our ORs because the ORs are, have to be consistently cleaned um, thoroughly um, from every corner. <laughs> there are very specific requirements for terminal cleaning. Um, so at our hospital, we're currently not using it um, at this time. However, I don't think that it could replace the um, human element to address all of the high touch places. And um, that includes the um, bed rails, bed surface, supply cart, the overbed table, and the pumps that are located within the room. Those are these high touch points. Um, so although the, the UV germ zapping kind of tool can be a helpful, um, I think that um, it could be more supplemental to the human element that cl of cleaning. Because if we wanna address dust, um, dust and dirt and blood and those types of things to really clean, um, I think that still requires that human element. So I think it could be a supplement. Okay, all right. You know, um, so there are a lot of things that we really need to work on. Uh, so as you, have talked to your colleagues and even from your own experience, what do you think the bottlenecks are in, for example, patient care, patient comfort, you know, um, and, um, and 
what do you think robotics could help uh, uh, be more, most beneficial for? Right. So I think um, a lot of uh, things that could help with efficiency and then lack of use of, uh, like preventing use of PPE would be delivery of food, medications, and supplies. Um, so I, I mentioned um, the iPads, for instance, if we had a robot go into the room to deliver those types of items versus a person. Um, a huge thing that I thought would be highly helpful would be taking samples for testing. If there was a technology that could prevent that human contact, such as, um, um, I don't know, some sort of procedure that an, a robot could do instead of a person to prevent the use of PPE, that would increase that, that uh, resource to be used for the treatment of people with COVID-19. So if we can, because um, just this past week within one large healthcare organization in Massachusetts, only 14% of those individuals tested positive. And so if you think about how much PPE was used, 86% of those people that were ne negative we're using PPE to complete the test, right? So if we could maybe have the robotics help with the testing procedure, that would be incredibly helpful in this cr current climate. For other resources such as security, um, I think robotics could play a great role, especially for after hours and areas that people aren't walking through and maybe cameras aren't equipped to be there. Um, and also, um, uh, additionally, another part was um, deconning the masks. So right now there's Battelle, it's a, a critical care decon system in Boston that has been um, delivered over there. And what they're doing is they're taking the masks from the hospitals to the decon in order to reuse the PPE. So if we could have a robot actually collect those masks to prevent the humans from touching those masks, that would be extremely helpful. Great, great. Well, Tamara, I want to thank you for your time, and I want one, just one quick last question, which is, if you had to put a pin on it, what is the greatest need that you think robotics could address in a pandemic? Testing. Great. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Robin, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Tamara, really, this was great. Um, and thank you very much for sharing with us. So everyone, Roboticist, I hope you learned a lot. Do keep watching the website, Roboticist uh, for Infectious Diseases. The webpage will have a list of more interviews, more reports, and more activities.